Yugoslav climbers Jose Roseman and Maria Frontar only stood 150 meters from the summit of Mount Kanchenjunga, yet there they were arguing with each other about whether to continue or descend. Maria wanted to keep going while Jose argued that they did not have enough oxygen and were already weak. In life, you are presented with choices every day, but on the third highest peak in the world, any one of those choices can decide if you live or if you die. This is their story. The Slovene Kanchenjunga expedition arrived at Mount Kanchenjunga in 1991 on April 12th. It would be one of the largest of the year as they were composed of 11 Slovenian men, a Slovene woman, a Croatian man, and two Polish women. The goal would be to achieve several summits of the mountain from the west, an attempt of the east face of Kumpakarna, and a new route on the southwest ridge of Kanchenjunga. The expedition worked in a buddy system, where you always had one other climber with you watching your back. This allowed them to move in smaller teams which gave the expedition more freedom. For the most part though, the middle days of April were mainly spent setting up camps and preparing the route on the western flank. Victor Groselge and Stipe Bozik would be the first on Mount Kanchenjunga as they set up Camp 1 on April 15th at 6,200 meters. The same pair would also set up Camp 2 at 6,750 meters on April 20th. After establishing the two camps, Victor and Stipe returned to the base camp to rest and prepare for a summit attempt as they would be the first ones to try. The team couldn't help but notice the clear weather as they climbed, but with that being said, there had been particularly strong winds since they arrived. So strong, in fact, that many climbers had to take shelter from its brutality if they were not actively moving. Otherwise, their chances of frostbite were much higher. Many of the climbers' journals consistently referenced the difficulties as the winds were documented to have hurricane strength. Now imagine being 7,000 meters on a mountain facing wind strength of 120 kilometers per hour, trying to rip your hands and feet from its face. Seems pretty terrifying if you ask me. Jose, Maria, and another duo climbed to Camp 2 after it was established with the plan of going further, and on April 22nd, they successfully erected Camp 3 at 7,250 meters. Exhausted and spent, the four would return to base camp to rest and eventually try for a summit attempt themselves. Victor and Stipe were back at base camp when they heard about Camp 3 being successfully pitched. The anticipation was building for the two as their summit day inched closer and closer. After resting for five days and feeling completely rejuvenated, Victor and Stipe would begin their climb on Mount Kimchinjunga. They left base camp on April 25th. It took several days, but they eventually made it to Camp 3 safely. But as soon as they arrived, the weather prevented them from moving forward as it began to snow. After spending the night at Camp 3 though, they did not want to wait any longer. And so with the help of a Sherpa, the three climbers spent most of the day grueling up the mountain. And on April 30th, their efforts were rewarded when they succeeded successfully established Camp 4 at 7,600 meters. Luckily, the weather on May 1st was perfect and the three climbers successfully summited Mount Kenchenjunga at 1.30 p.m., marking the summit to be Victor Grosjel's ninth 8,000er. They all congratulated each other with proud smiles, but they knew the drill, enjoy the summit quickly, and get the hell off the mountain. Unluckily for the group, weather turned for the worse in the afternoon as storm clouds and fog began to obscure visibility. But Victor, Stipe, and their Sherpa were all experienced climbers and did not panic. They just kept going, and without realizing it, the team actually passed Camp 4 on their way down. Normally a terrible situation to be in, but these climbers had the necessary experience to deal with it. It was hard work, but the trio staggered into Camp 3 at 11 p.m. They had been climbing for close to 16 consistent hours. Insane. They were met by none other than Jose Roseman and Maria Frantar, who had left base camp on April 30th for their own summit attempt. Jose and Maria would spend their first day on the mountain reaching Camp 2. The next day, May 1st, they would reach Camp 3, which is the same day Victor, Stipe, and their Sherpa summited. The duo only brought one bottle of oxygen, as Maria wanted to summit without it. Because of the turn of weather, they struggled in the later half of the day, expending more energy than they originally thought they would. Jose and Maria did not expect to see the successful summit climbers, but late in the night, they walked into camp, barely able to function properly. 
Once fed and warm, they were eager to share their success, the root conditions, and where not to go. Jose and Maria ate this information up as they gladly accepted any help with their own summit attempts. Everyone rested that night with the anticipation of another big day. Victor and Stipe would return to base camp the next morning on May 2nd, successful, while Jose and Maria would continue on to Camp 4. They would successfully reach the camp later that day. They rested that night, and the plan was to be climbing for the summit by 10 a.m. the next morning. Now, the duo actually never radioed when they left Camp 4, so it is impossible for us to know the exact time that they left, but the others at base camp started to be worried from what they were beginning to see. In 1991, the weather predictions were not as accurate as they are today, but at the time, they were still very proficient. Leaders of the expedition would carefully analyze the weather for the upcoming days and they would try to work around them, and there was no indication of a storm. But the morning of May 3rd brought the coldest and windiest day of the expedition. Storm clouds from the west began to appear on the horizon. It was the worst possible timing for Jose and Maria as they were sitting at 7,600 meters. Whether they ignore the signs or just didn't know, it's impossible to tell because again, the duo did not radio to base camp that they had left for the summit. In fact, nobody knew where the duo was because they could not spot them on the mountain either. Each climber at base camp grew more and more anxious as the storm to the west grew larger and closer to Mount Kanchenjunga. Finally at 3 p.m., a call was heard over the radio. It was Jose and Maria. They did confirm that they left Camp 4 at their planned time, and from where they currently stood, they were only a mere 150 meters from the 8,586 meter summit. However, the duo had noticed a storm and had already been struggling to make it to this point. They made very good progress in the morning, but as the winds got stronger in the afternoon, they began to become more and more fatigued. Remember, Maria wanted to summit without bottled oxygen as well, so the duo did not even have supplemental oxygen to help with their energy levels. It was at this point that Jose could not go any further. Maria really wanted to push for the summit, so began the disagreement on whether to continue or to turn back. They would go back and forth for a while and eventually decide to ask for a third opinion as their conversation was going nowhere. Due to their circumstances, when the pair finally contacted base camp, they were strongly advised to turn around quickly. They had an important decision to make, and who knows if it was already too late to save themselves. But if they continued to summit, would they even have a chance to try? Ten minutes later, they were descending the peak. Base camp nervously waited for their next call as a dreadful atmosphere had begun to creep up on the camp. Every member began to feel it. Something just felt off. Back on Mount Kanchenjunga, the duo were making steady work. Given their conditions, the thought was that if they were to survive, they needed to make it to Camp 4 and hope for the best, which would be about a 700 meter descent given their last known location. The hours slowly ticked by as the sun began to set on the horizon. This was not good. Without the sun, temperatures would drop even further, causing the wind to have more of an impact. It is an extremely vicious combo when you add the two together. It was not until 6 p.m. that another call was heard. Jose and Maria were alive. Granted, their voices sound muffled and weak, but they were still going. At this point, some at base camp were visibly worried, pacing in circles in their tents as their comrades were fighting for their lives on that peak. Basically, the overall consensus of the call was that Jose and Maria were in trouble. They may still be moving now, but if they did not find Camp 4 soon, they would not have the energy to fight the winds. It only took one more hour before another call came in. It was a little past 7 p.m. when Jose's broken voice was calling out for help. It was dark, freezing, and they had lost their way. They no longer were confident in their route and think they may have missed Camp 4. A broken voice trying to compete against the howling of the wind. There was nothing anyone at base camp could do. This would be the last time Jose or Maria would ever be heard from again. That night there was little hope of survival, but nevertheless as humans it's hard to not hold on just a little. The next day on May 4th, Wanda Rukovic climbed to Camp 4. However, right before she reached camp, she found Jose Roseman's body. He had passed Camp 4 by 200 meters. He did not show any signs of significant trauma, so it was assumed that the cause of death was related to exhaustion. I have covered a story about Wanda Rukovic before as she is one of the most successful female and just general mountaineers to ever climb. So if you'd like to check out that video, please click here. The next day, May 5th, climbers Robert Zarzan and Dare Juhant climbed to Camp 4 as well. By chance, they found Maria's body at 7,500 meters. 
only 100 meters past Camp 4. They noticed similar features to Jose. There didn't appear to be any significant trauma from a fall, just that they had collapsed from exhaustion. Finding the body of their friends was the best anyone from the expedition could do. They called off all further climbing activities out of respect. A ceremony was held for both Jose and Maria as they were buried together in a big crevasse on Mount Kanchenjunga. Every day we are faced with decisions. Whether big or small, those decisions have impacts on our lives and the lives of those around us. Other times, those decisions can change history itself by simply changing your path. On that day, Jose and Maria's fate wasn't decided just under the summit, as even if they had climbed the last 150 meters, the likelihood is that they would not have changed the outcome. No, the decision that impacted them the most was at Camp 4, when they decided to attempt a summit, but they did not realize at the time the impact a storm they had, no idea was even coming, would have on their lives. Sometimes we can make decisions, and sometimes it just doesn't matter.